um, but we are going to be producing those in-house. We have a prototype uh, or, or pilot um, cell production lab that's being built right now that'll allow us to build the first few packs and cells that we need for this year. Um, and then of course, uh, those partnerships that we're looking to, I'm hoping to sign agreements with in the next 30 to 60 days, will actually be what carries us from say a few thousand cells to millions of cells. Today on the Plugged In Podcast, we're interviewing CEO Mark Hanschett of Atlas Motors. It's an electric pickup truck company based in Arizona. And today we have a few questions to ask him about his company. Uh, first off, when did you found your company and why did you found it? Uh, yeah, Atlas Motor Vehicles was officially founded in 2016. Uh, and the reason I uh, sort of created Atlas Motor Vehicles was it started with the idea of just building an electric pickup truck because no one was doing that at the time. Um, but it has grown into something much bigger than that uh, as we've sort of progressed over the years and seen opportunity that's beyond just being another OEM. Okay, so uh, right now you have a couple concepts of your pickup trucks. You have the dually and then you have a uh, like a, I'm trying to think of the word, like a single uh, rear wheel. Yeah, yep. that version. So are you, because right now with where you stand, are you ever thinking about in the future, once this comes out to produce any other vehicles based on that platform, like an SUV? Yeah. So we don't have any plans for an SUV. If we ever did build an SUV, it would be probably around the size of like a, a, a Yukon, right? Or a, a, a Tahoe something more full size than compact. Um, but our primary focus right now is uh, really class 2B to class four pickup trucks. And then after that, our, our immediate focus will actually be going to a class five and six uh, trucks. So if you wanna compare that to existing markets today, think uh, medium duty um, work vehicles. So dump vehicles, flatbed vehicles, tow vehicles, things like that. All of that is scalable within the platform that we're building or developing today. Okay. And it's interesting actually from talking to you before. So you were saying like your main kind of USP is that you guys are very strongly focused on the commercial segment as opposed to say, you know, Rivian who are a more adventure kind of lifestyle and then Cybertruck again falls into that category. So is that where you really see um, Atlas standing out amongst the crowd? Yeah, so uh, outside of just the vehicles, it's what we can build with those vehicles. It's that sort of ecosystem approach to a holistic solution around work vehicles. So whether you're an individual owner or a fleet owner, it's how we're going to leverage those vehicles and the technology and cloud services to bring all of that together. Um, will we sell to consumers? Absolutely, in which they can utilize that entire sort of network as well. Um, we definitely want to, don't want to turn it down. I mean, I drive a pickup truck. It's more of a work truck than a luxury truck, um, but it's also my family vehicle and it's what I, you know, I use it to get things done. So uh, we see the opportunity there. I don't, lifestyle vehicles are cool, but to me, they're not useful. Um, they're not holistically useful. So we're really trying to be focused on that sort of work centric or do stuff uh, market focus. Cool. I mean, that's actually, I remember because you were just going on about the sizes there. Um, so like, you know, first I'm based in Ireland and, you know, trucks are gradually beginning to become more and more popular here. Of course, we don't have F-150s, but we have Rangers, you know, and I know your uh -huh. truck is kind of mid-sized. So would you guys have ever any plans to sell in Europe or outside of North America? Uh, so, well, our truck is full size. So it's, um, think like uh, high-end F-150 and above. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, do we ever plan to do a mid-sized truck, which would be like a Ranger or a Colorado uh, Tacoma, right? Things like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a scale down from where our current sort of market focus is. But when we start looking internationally and we start looking at Europe, uh, start looking at the Middle East, Africa, China, Asia in general, then you're looking at mid-sized to actually compact trucks uh, and the okay. opportunities that are there. Whereas then there's 
Australia, which is a heavily sort of untapped market that's very interested in the full-size market, and it's dominated by the mid-size market today. So we see opportunity mm -hmm. there with our current vehicle segments. And then, of course, as we grow, we'll go up and then we'll go down. Cool. Yeah, I know that, that's interesting about Australia, right? Because they're crazy into trucks, like, you know, with all the youth and everything, yeah. Right, right. And the off-road um, adventure world is is massive there as well. Yeah, in the outback, of course. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Um, so, <clears throat> also, um, you go on about the charging setup and, of course, having, like, incredibly fast charging batteries. So, can you tell us a bit more about your batteries and what makes them so unique and special? Yeah, so um, if you want to build something in this space, you have two options. Uh, we'll start with, you can catalog engineer it, which is what most startups are doing today, which is you pull a bunch of parts that exist and you sort of cobble them together to build a vehicle, but you're not solving a real problem. Um, the, what we wanted to really do is when we look at the work market and we look at towing and hauling and things like that, um, there's a problem that's introduced, right? So if you're gonna introduce new technology, go from internal combustion to electric vehicles, it can't be a leap backwards, which in all honesty, existing electric vehicles are a step backwards. Um, they're great to drive, everything's fantastic until you think about charging. And when we mm. think about towing, your range might go from 500 miles down to 250 or 150, which means you go down to maybe drive for two hours and charge for an hour right, or drive for three hours and charge for an hour. And that's a non-starter in this particular community. Hang on one second, I'm sorry. Um, and it's one of those things where we wanted to really solve a problem there. So what makes us unique is that we, rather than build a vehicle first, we focus on the underlying technology first, batteries. That's 80%. That's like the, the heart and the guts and everything that make an electric course, vehicle work. Yeah. So in order to do that too, we couldn't just buy something. We had to go all the way down to the cell level to drive innovation, to be able to do something like charging quickly. So um, what we actually have is um, we've got a proprietary cell design that's in development today. We'll start producing later this year. Um, and what we're doing at its core is actually in thermal management. Um, so we're actually, we heat the cell up, but we do it evenly. Um, which actually reduces some of that uh, internal impedance that's inside the cell, which allows us to push more energy into it. It also minimizes risk in terms of things like dendrite growth and catastrophic issues that can occur there. Um, and what we also do with that is it allows us to extract heat from it at a very efficient rate. So um, I guess the best way to put that in practical terms would be what we're able to do is ultra fast charge in Arizona in the like hottest day of the summer versus right. only, yeah. only being able to do it in a maybe like a northern state or a higher altitude location where the temperatures are sometimes lower, where your temperature differential is so high that you can actually do that or accomplish that. So um, that's what makes Atlas unique is it's not fast charging uh, that, or sorry, that technology is so unique is that it's not fast charging just in certain areas or certain conditions. It's all the time. Cool. So do you plan on uh, producing your own batteries for your own vehicles? Or are you uh, planning yeah. on marketing it out or licensing it out for another supplier to make it? Um, so we, we plan on producing them in-house. Uh, we're working on signing contracts with partners that will help us do that. Um, but we are going to be producing those in-house. We have a prototype uh, or, or pilot um, cell production lab that's being built right now that'll allow us to build the first few packs and cells that we need for this year. Um, and then of course, uh, those partnerships that we're looking to, I'm hoping to sign agreements with in the next 30 to 60 days will actually be what carries us from say a few thousand cells to millions of cells. Um, yes. But we do plan so, on doing all of that in house. Yeah, so I'd like to add something for taking an objective look at this and saying you're an investor and seeing this with your company versus, I don't wanna name names, but other electric Others. car companies. Yeah, that yeah. say that they have all this stuff. And then when you have like you're saying, all these deals lined up, that's, that's really promising. And 
very impressive for a uh, startup company. Yeah, so it, the question you should always ask yourself, especially when starting an automotive company is how do you de-risk the steps to get to that end target? And how do you think bigger than just the vehicle? Because if I'm another startup in this ecosystem, I'm going to spend a billion dollars before I make my first dollar. Mm. Atlas is really trying to focus on how do I spend a few million to maybe a hundred million dollars before I make my first dollar? How does that create a successful business in and of itself? So when we move to that billion dollar mark where we're producing hundreds of thousands of trucks per year, then I've already de-risked that entire operation because what's going to stall us there is the battery technology. And that's also a licensable, sellable market opportunity for us. If we never get to the truck, we've got a battery business or an energy business actually uh, that's being developed and built. Yeah, so on the topic of that, would you, I mean, obviously once everything moves along faster, would you consider having like something like a Tesla Powerwall that you'd sell with your battery technology into people's houses? Yeah, we want to be a holistic solutions provider, and you're already building the technology for energy storage for the vehicle, um, and that also helps us build energy storage for charging ecosystems, for construction sites, for um, commercial real estate or commercial properties and businesses that utilize that, and then, of course, consumer side. So we see massive market opportunities in the energy storage and eventually even maybe energy production, but energy storage and sort of being that holistic solutions provider, not just for the transportation side, but for everything that kind of matters within that ecosystem. So when I say Atlas is bigger than just the pickup truck, the pickup truck is the thing you touch every day. It's that sexy, cool thing that everybody wants. The business is actually the rest of the ecosystem that comes around that and supports that. And um, for the XT, oh, sorry, I'm not there, but I was saying, uh, so for the XT itself, like what is your next kind of phase in terms of getting that into production now? I know you're working on the battery technology, but I mean, you still need to raise more capital before you can kind of move forward to on to next stages in it or uh, like yeah, is there we a production have to... line in development or? Yep, so there, uh, we have to continue to raise capital to, to get to that goal. Um, we've raised a few million dollars so far. We're raising $25 million currently. Um, we are, a lot of people have asked us about things like SPACs. We're in discussions today around that. Um, nothing concrete. That's actually, when we started those conversations, we said, uh, we started with, is this real? Is this something we really want to do? Because it's a, a shift in the company's focus on how we get something done. Um, so we're very skeptical in that space, actually, uh, about what's going on there and, and what the opportunities are. But we are having those discussions. Um, in terms of uh, fundraising, we're still raising funding. We're developing those, those technologies to a production-ready state. Um, and as part of that, it's, it's taking it not just from a design to a production-ready state, but to a a manufacturability or manufacturing production ready state. And that will be our focus for 2021. Um, in terms of next steps, we have the energy side, which is the battery cells and pack technology that's going into uh, market this year. We've got the XP platform. Now the platform is everything but the windows, doors, seats, um, sheet metal, headlights, taillights, but it is um, all the control modules, like the body control modules that go into the vehicles. It is the steering and braking pedal assemblies, um, infotainment screens, all of that is part of that platform to make that thing work. Um, so you could, in fact, our, our buck that you've seen pictures of online, I mean, that's just a cage. So we have something to sit in. Um, and then it has the steering and a prototype uh, uh, UI UX screen that's sitting there. That's all that's required to drive the vehicle outside of like your, your airbag and other safety systems. So yeah, it's interesting um, that you said, um, sorry. <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> that you said that um, a lot of it's being all developed in house and stuff, but like, is there any other manufacturers you're talking to? I know like, for example, um, the Tesla Model S for, takes a lot of parts from the uh, previous gen Mercedes E-Class. I think like the shifters and stuff are kind of taken from that. So are there any other manufacturers you're looking to take parts from for your truck? or uh, not 
Yeah, not necessarily. Um, we we do collaborate with suppliers on certain things. The most notable would be, uh, and actually the easiest to explain would be brakes, um, okay. wheels, tires, things like that, mm -hmm. right? Those are things yeah. that I, I, I'm not going to try and reinvent today. Um, in terms of uh, the body in white, the sheet metal work and things like that, um, we're looking to sign a partner on uh, over the next couple of months that'll be able to take us to low volume, short run production. And then we're looking for that partner that's going to allow us to scale through 2022 and beyond uh, that can come in and help build that facility and that capability in house. Those are not core competencies for Atlas. Atlas's mm -hmm. core competency is everything else below that and then encompassing within that ecosystem that's involved. So we build all of the underlying technology, but the things that are not necessarily something that we should take on in house, at least right now, are like body and white, um, which is all the sheet metal work uh, that's involved there. Uh, even some of the frame structure stuff and things like that, we are uh, in discussions with a partner today that's actually developing our next generation underlying frame structure and subframe structures uh, that's doing a lot of that work for us while we take care of all sort of the guts and everything that's involved, that's sort of plugs in there. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of the, uh, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. So regarding your ecosystem, you mentioned, so obviously this is a newer company. How would you plan on doing servicing, for example? Yeah, it's, uh, that's a fantastic question. So um, I think I, I'll, cap, I'll, I'll start this off with, I think the one mistake that the automotive industry does today is they outsource their end customer experience, um, which means they, uh, they work with either a dealership or a partner um, like another, I think there was a Camping World uh, announcement the other day for another startup that's out there. Um, I think that if you're outsourcing the end customer experience, you're sort of letting go whether or not you're successful or not, because that partner, while they may have a personal incentive to drive success for you, they're going to do whatever it takes for them to be successful themselves and not necessarily the rest of the ecosystem. They don't care about the holistic success of the company, they only care about their little tiny space that they operate in. So Atlas is going to take the approach of, we are going to build starting with remote service. Um, it'll be basically everything on the vehicle outside of the, yeah, I see you got a little cat there. Um, everything outside of the uh, 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 battery pack will be able to be fixed on the side of the road. So, um, and that means we can drive out, we can replace that part turn around, come back, right, and get you on the road. Our ultimate goal is to get you on the road within two hours. So anytime anything breaks within two hours, you're back on the road and you're moving. Um, that won't happen at first, but that's, that's the long-term goal for us. Uh, in terms of doing services for heavier items like the batteries, or maybe you got to replace a whole body panel, uh, like a bed, right, or the cab is, is damaged in an accident, um, those things, uh, Actually, Rob Healy, who just came on board here a couple months ago, uh, is working on that rollout plan that will actually, it'll be partners to start, but long-term Atlas is looking at um, service stations that are Atlas owned. And we're actually looking at, uh, and this is, I guess, semi-public, but not really, but who cares? Um, we're actually looking at, as we, as we look to roll out long, like uh, nationwide charging infrastructure and things like that, or we're trying to deal with things like um, uh, parts distribution and stuff like that. Let's start building service centers, but let's start building those service centers along highway corridors so we can build out the maintenance support infrastructure for either remote or local, but we're also building out the charging infrastructure, charging depots, uh, as well as various other amenities that you're looking for for that 15 minute time period that you're sitting there. Okay, so um, just as you said there about the charging infrastructure, you plan on building out your own charging infrastructure and not like relying on third parties, correct? Correct. So uh, it goes back to, do you want to outsource your customer experience or do you want to own it? Um, mm. And we want to own it. We want to own every piece of that. So, uh, and drive value along that entire path. We're also looking at supporting other vehicle manufacturers that are out there uh, that need to, uh, that need charging infrastructure built out. Atlas wants to own that ecosystem. We want to be have a major focus on that. That's why we're focusing on energy and battery battery storage and buffering and things like that, and trying to solve that problem. So that helps us build out the infrastructure. It also helps us uh, support the sort of EV movement as a whole. Um, and 
uh, so we're very much so focused on that. Okay. So on the website, I can see that there's kind of like a proprietary charging, uh, like sort of charging uh, infrastructure there. Can you explain more about that and how it can yeah. also integrate into third parties yeah. as well? Because I assume you want to do that. Yeah. So I was hoping I, I still had a prop here. I'm at my house. But um, the uh, Atlas, in order to achieve ultra fast charging, you can't do that with the CCS standards that are out there today. Right. Now there is, Charin has abandoned the CCS integration and they're doing their multi megawatt um, solution that they're in development today, but it's very commercial focused. Um, Atlas is looking to, because it doesn't exist and that's still probably another year and a half away. Um, Atlas is looking at what's going on there, but we're also looking at, okay, let's build our own solution because there are certain things that happen as part of that charging process that existing protocols like CCS and others don't support. Um, so in order for us to have a sort of a, a complete customer experience and a better customer experience, and in order for us to charge very quickly, we need at least one and a half megawatts of power. And we need that power to be deliverable in various different phases that we simply just cannot get out of CCS today because of the way CCS protocols work. Um, there's not enough power in the way the protocol functions. It doesn't allow us to do these things. So Atlas is actually developing our own charging technology, our own charging stations. We've uh, prototyped a handle. Um, we're developing the cable structure and everything. And it's very much so focused to be a, a similar experience to what you have with like a gas station today um, in terms of like handle weight and usability and things like that. And all drive through. Yeah. Like no more pulling and park. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. But yeah. Okay. Um, so were you saying like wire so wireless charging almost? Not wireless. No, not wireless. It is a it is a connection, like it's a handle okay. that yeah, plugs yeah, into yeah. the vehicle. Um, wireless would be nice, but the efficiencies and losses over wireless are just too high. So in order to do one and a half megawatts, that's a really big coil yeah, yeah. Um, that you need. Yeah, okay. so on um, the, uh... Ben? Oh, no, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so on that topic of charging ports, uh, I just want to ask you a question. Would you do a, like a 1J or a J1772 port on the car as well? Yeah, in actually case. on the, on the, it was on the front. We've actually moved it off. It's still up front, um, just ahead of the wheel well, just behind the headlight. Um, we are putting a uh, CCS 2.0, which includes J1772 okay. in there. Okay, so that's good to have just in case the infrastructure isn't fully built out in certain areas. Correct. Yeah, we okay. need to be able to support what exists today at home charging. And then of course, with the one and a half megawatt solution, in a pull through scenario. And unfortunately it's, that's the current solution today. Will that change in the future potentially? But there's a lot of infrastructure built today. Um, we just wanna get people off of that and to a much better experience as fast as we can. Okay. No more apps and cards and, and all that complication that, that exists there. Yeah, my cat keeps jumping up here. But, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's all good, man. I got, but, a, I got a cage built so my dog doesn't come running in and just tear the place down. Um, but, uh, yeah, so actually, um, so talking just for reference um, for our viewers, so the Alice XT pricing starts around $45,000, I believe, and that's for a version with a 200-mile range, uh, ranging up to in and around like 69 um with 500 mile range so um do you think like as you progress and you know make use of economies of scale and the company gets bigger and bigger hopefully um do you think there's potential for the prices to lower i like i know obviously that's very competitive price point but you think as the battery technology evolves and stuff there's always this discussion about electric cars going down and down cheaper to manufacture so do you think that, that there's a future in that for atlas so I think the, the big question is how does someone who can't afford like a $70,000 truck get into this market and be able to, to utilize that same technology? Um, and uh, yeah, I think over the next 10 years, what we're going to see is we're already seeing battery prices pulling below $100 a kilowatt hour, which mm. is really driving 
um, some of those end vehicle costs down very, very low if you don't add additional cost elsewhere. Atlas's goal is to not just be sort of that 45K and above medium to high end vehicles side of the business. We also want to capture the market that's down lower than that. And we're looking at the uh, used car market, which is actually a massively untapped sort of, um, it's an opportunity that no one focuses on today. So long term, we're not just looking at the 2.2 million, 2.4 million trucks, new trucks that are sold per year. Um, we're really looking at the 20 million trucks that are actually on the road today. Um, and how do we sort of build out a business model that allows us to provide this capability, this opportunity, this experience to maybe those that can, that really do need it, but can't necessarily mm. afford those very expensive new trucks that are out there today. And I do see prices continuing to drop. I see more affordable vehicles coming, but really it's about that whole ecosystem. How do I get this to a point where you don't buy a $45,000 truck and then spend $8,000 a year in maintenance how do we get it to a point where you can just pay one very low price, very easy monthly payment, own that vehicle, do what you need to do with it, and then have everything sort of covered within that? Um, I don't think shared economies, I, I'm going to ramble a little bit here, but I don't think the shared economy is the future. Um, I think the I subscription model. So subscription model is the future, but it's not a like, I own the truck today and then my neighbor uses it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think that's, I think. I, I don't see that being the future very specifically in the work segment, but even in the consumer segment, I don't see that being a possibility. Um, it's, it's not within human nature to, to operate that way, um, especially in more rural cities and things like that. But um, it just, it doesn't seem like so far there's no indications today. And in fact, the market's actually saying that this isn't going to happen. Um, so the future is subscription to some extent, but it's a, completely different type of subscription model. Um, okay. It's more of like, a, um, v, we call it VAS, VAAS, sorry, vehicle as a service, which means you own the vehicle. It will be the first and last one you ever buy. And throughout that 20 plus years that you're driving, you'll continuously get hardware upgrades as well as software upgrades. Um, think of it as, as technology progresses, we want to continuously provide that to you without having you to come back and or without asking you to come back and spend another 50 grand. It's more or less just, you have access to this, you do what you need to it or with it. Um, and then we continuously maintain it, service it and upgrade it for the next 20 plus years. Yeah, so yeah, with what you said idea. about, yeah. yeah, so with what you said about the uh, subscription service, and I, I completely agree that agree with what you said about the pickup trucks because I live in Charlotte, North Carolina and pickup trucks are everywhere. Like people want to own the trucks. They don't want to share them. But I think in other sectors, like I'll try to think of an example, like smaller cars, like BMW i3, if that was on a subscription in cities, people would be more fine sharing that. But I think pickup trucks are completely different. In markets where you don't already own a car today, or it's incredibly inconvenient. You're in a high density, like sort of urban setting versus a more rural setting um, where you don't, I mean, you might own a vehicle today, but you maybe never drive it. Um, that's a different, like that's a different market. That's a different use case. Uh, it's something where you take public transportation every day. So therefore there's no need for you to have it. And whenever you did need a car, you just rent one anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but where I look at it is uh, more like maybe Phoenix or even Southern California or Michigan, where I'm from, or Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, right? Those sort of Midwestern states, even Texas, where vehicle ownership, things are so spread out. Things are so sort of just everywhere. Um, the idea that uh, I'm going to rent a car for 30 bucks to go from this to that side of town and then maybe I give that car up at that point or I rent it for a day and then I come back. One, it's not financially viable to do that. Um, Uber is not financially viable for anybody today as a replacement for a car. Um, and I've, like, I've done the math, even my pickup truck when it's new, when gas was $4.25 a gallon, it was still cheaper to drive that than it would be for me to take an Uber everywhere I wanna go. Um, so in some cases, 
where you don't own a vehicle today, it makes sense. You probably won't own one tomorrow. But in situations like where I'm at here, where we own two vehicles, um, it's very practical. Uh, in fact, it's simple, it's practical. My truck is loaded down with stuff that I use constantly and it's loaded down with stuff I need occasionally and it brings value to me um, all the time. So I'll, I think the mistake that everyone makes is they focus on the 80% use case and they say, well, 80% of the time you only need this, so let's deliver that. And they forget that people find value in the other 20%. Hmm. So I have a quick so, question. So you're talking about bringing down the cost, but I've seen on your website that you also have sale of excess energy back to the grid. Do you have like any sort of partnerships or any sort of plans for how, how this process will like carry out the V to G process? Yeah, so um, it won't necessarily be a V to G. Uh, there'll be sort of an interim battery buffer that's inside there right. uh, or that's in between there. But um, yeah, and uh, that's one of the things that Rob's sort of working on um, is starting to establish some of those relationships and those partnerships. Um, service integration into utility is a very hard thing to do because uh, I want to say there's, I can't remember the exact number, but it's insane when you think about it. It's like above 10,000 utility companies or something like that within the, the country. Or So I can't remember, the, I could be over-exaggerating that or not, but I know it's several thousand utility companies in the country. Every single one of those has a different model, a different relationship, a different, like it's, it's just complicated. And finding a way to simplify that is going to be the key to the future. Now, I think it's, uh, the future is microgrids. It is not necessarily holistic distribution, um, but distribution will be necessary in certain areas where something like solar is not abundant. Um, you know, here in Arizona, I, we take that for granted, right? We have 360 some days of sunlight per year. Uh, so it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, solar panel on the roof, right? Charge it for the five days a year. I've got battery buffer and hey, it only technically is overcast for like two hours of that day. Um, but in areas like say where I'm from in Michigan, where there's uh, snowfall and there's overcast, you know, for six months out of the year, seven months out of the year, uh, London, right, might be a great example of where the weather is not always perfect. That's a different scenario. And I think we'll come up with solutions to, to resolve those as well. But it's going to be more um, sort of distributed energy storage and production versus small isolated facilities and then networking it up. Yeah, yeah that's so. a good point. I mean, where I live, it's like cloud covered like 95% of the time. So. Right, right. And <laughs> yeah. I, I do think, I will make this prediction that, uh, and I, I'm, the market we're starting to see this is that today you pay per kilowatt hour of consumption, tomorrow you will pay for access. That's it. It won't matter how much, it won't matter how little, it'll be one fee that you pay, maybe it's like a hundred bucks a month. And for a hundred bucks a month, you have access to electricity or maybe it's 150 and you have access to electricity, which will also be for your car or your vehicle. It will be for your home. It'll be for everything you do. Um, and this mm. concept or idea of consumption will actually disappear. I think it will go the route of uh, think cloud storage where it just becomes so cheap that it doesn't make sense to charge for consumption when it's just so cheap to actually utilize it. Even though in the background, the you know, the hardware is wearing out and they're replacing it and, and things are going on in the background. It's just so cheap, it doesn't matter. Hmm. Interesting. And so about like, um, like at the moment, we're not quite near that level. I mean, if you look at, I don't think there's, like every car in America at the moment was electric. There'd be nowhere near enough like power for the charging grid available. So it, it's interesting to see like where will all this excess power come from and from what forms, from solar, from tidal, from new, like nuclear even, I don't know. But um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. It's, all right. it's a chicken and egg concept, right? Is uh, do we wait until the, the uh, utility catches up or do we not, or do we push out the cars and then force utility mm. to catch up? I wouldn't worry about the utility side. Companies like Atlas are really going to be pushing solutions within that market to support what we're developing. I think tomorrow, this is why I don't think, if you're, a, if you're an electric vehicle startup and you're just focused on building a vehicle, you're dead already. 
Um, you have to be thinking holistic solutions. You have to be thinking network and ecosystem. Uh, and I, I think what we'll see in the future, and my prediction is uh, specific, specifically for Atlas, is that we will be a holistic solutions provider that will overcome the gaps that are perceived in the uh, utility side of the business. Um, again, it'll, it'll come down to you'll pay seven, 800 bucks a month and you'll have electricity, you'll have a vehicle, you'll have insurance, you'll have charging, like all the stuff. You won't even think about it. You'll be thinking about what fun thing am I going to do this weekend? Not do I have to pay my you know, utility bill so I can go play some video games. I see the controllers in the background. That's why I'm. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still on the PS4 here. Like we haven't gotten no PS5s yet, unfortunately, in Ireland, but sure. <laughs> mm. Yeah, hopefully soon. Um, no, yeah, that's that's interesting, right? What you said about the whole ecosystem, so you'll be covering everywhere. I mean, I think Tesla now are just starting. Um, Matt, you were telling me in California only you can get Tesla insurance. Um, yeah. So that's quite interesting. That's the first I've ever heard of an uh, automaker providing their own insurance. Uh, so yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. So we've. Cool. Uh, um, yeah, so we've discussed a fair amount about energy, but I think one thing that we all want to know about is the performance. What does the Atlas XT provide? Like horsepower, torque, that stuff. I think we are uh, interested in that. So I think uh, everybody wants to know that question. Um, we typically don't focus on horsepower and torque because, and I'll, I'll tell you why, um, horsepower, 600 continuous horsepower. Um, peak horsepower is going to be something above a megawatt. Uh, or above a thousand horsepower, but um, I think uh, peak or continuous horsepower six hundred. That's for those like eight percent hill climbs, right? Uh, that are there, and to achieve that, it's not just in the motor tech or the the um, inverter side. It's in the battery pack, and that's why we focused on that. Was we need to be able to continuously provide a high output of energy for a long period of time. Uh, and then when you come back down the hill on the other side, we got to pump all that energy back in. And what we can't run into is, oh, your battery's too warm or you've stressed it too much. So therefore you got to use friction brakes versus regen. Although we're uh, from a software side, we're handling all that in the background. So you wouldn't really know the difference. Um, but uh, really trying to focus on that. Uh, torque, um, I will say the output target torque right now is above 12,000 foot pounds at the wheels with all four wheels combined. There's a 7.3 to one currently in the gearbox, 7.3 to one gear ratio between the motor and the output. So, you know, if you take 12,000 and divide it by 7.3, you get what um, the motor torque output is for all four of those. Um, the reason for that is just that get up and go initially, um, which is actually, it's very competitive with um, like a diesel pickup truck in first gear with a certain gear ratio today. The reason why we don't say that that much, like you may have seen, I think Hummer did like, oh, we put out 12,400 foot pounds or something of torque at all four wheels. Okay, I'll change the gear ratio to eight to one. And now I've just trumped them by 2000. What it, it really doesn't matter. What we really wanna focus on is maintaining speed going up a hill, towing 35,000 pounds, not uh, gimmicky either. It's, it's on a trailer, right? It's, uh, it's loaded. It's there's drag there. There's a lot of things there. Consistency. So whether we achieve that with 600 horsepower or 500 horsepower or 700 horsepower, that's not the goal. The goal is zero to 60 in a certain time period uh, with a fully loaded trailer under 16 seconds. And if you're towing, if you buy a truck that can do say 10,000 pounds towing, or you buy a truck that can do 35,000 pounds towing the experience is the same. That's the, that's the whole thing. If you think of a fleet company where it's like, I get in one truck and I get in another one and it's completely different. How do we give this experience and this experience? How do we make that identical? Um, and that's really about like, how do we make your world simpler and easier? Um, and what happens in the background to achieve that is, is I guess not as important, but as a consumer, you're like, I got 600 horsepower, I got 700, I got 800, I got 900. I could do zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds or something like that. Um, we won't talk about those numbers quite yet. We have targeted performance numbers that we're aiming for. Um, we say less than six seconds, zero to 60, only because that's an easy target. 
But if you mm -hmm. think 600 continuous horsepower, some peak that's way up here, a whole lot of torque, it's going to be in the three second range. Um, but until we do testing and clarify all of that stuff, we're just, we don't want to talk about it too much and make so it plenty quick. That. We can assume. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I think, uh, somebody put it best the other day. We want like face melting, you know, acceleration, but, um, we'll, we'll work towards that. Uh, but it's really just, it's, we want to focus on consistency and making it easy for you to transition between vehicles or drive the vehicle. Yeah. So one other question is, are all the, uh, are all your models going to provide all wheel drive or is the base model going to be rear wheel drive or. I, yeah. I think you said it's single motor rear wheel drive, isn't it? The base no. model. Like what? Oh, no, no, it's all four wheel drive. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the For base 45,000. Yeah. That's so the base. Bad, yeah. Then yeah, you get a $7,500 tax credit. Yes. That's, exactly. that's not bad at all. Especially. Right. Might so, undercut the uh, cyber truck. Yeah, well, Cybertruck's base ones, single motor, rear wheel drive, 39K Cybertruck, yeah. Yep, yeah, so our goal is 45K four wheel drive, and right now all the math says we're gonna hit it. So um, we, uh, we're very confident in that particular price point. So for your range numbers, do you plan on basing your range numbers on uh, say full gross weight or say mid range or that type of thing? How do you plan on? So, um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Typically you don't base it on like full toe weight. It's typically, um, well, there's EPA, there's WPA, I think is what it is. Um, which is like WLTP, the European yeah. stand WLTP, sorry. Um, yeah, WPA is probably some school thing or something that I just <laughs> off the top of my head, but, uh, um, you typically base it on those drive cycles. Uh, but they're like unloaded with a certain weight of a passenger, right? Or something like that. Um, our 500 mile range is uh, the, the max one is actually, it's not based on towing 35,000 pounds. Um, it is based on a real world use case. So rather than using the EPA standard, which typically when you do that, and then you get on say the freeway at 65, 75 miles an hour, um, that range drops drastically. I know on my Model 3, it's 220 to 240 miles of range, even though it's supposed to get 305, maybe 310, 15, whatever the new number is. Um, and sometimes it's even less than 200 miles of range. So we're really trying to focus on real world use cases and driving conditions versus the standardized DPA cycles, even though we still have to follow those uh, because we wanna give you that consistent performance. Mm -hmm. um, so when we say 500 miles of range, that's 65 to 70 miles an hour on the freeway. That's, you know, the car loaded with at least two adults. So there's an extra, say, let's say 500 pounds in there because um, they all weigh 200 plus like myself. Um, so we, we really try to focus on that. And then from a design and efficiency standpoint, um, we are designing the system so that when you're towing those heavy weights, the efficiency curves are not diving like this. So um, when you think about an electric motor, it typically has like a sweet spot of efficiency. And then when your, your torque value goes up right over a certain RPM, then your efficiency sort of drops off and tanks from there. We're really trying to focus on, yeah, we'll get great efficiency while driving unloaded, but we want to get that curve as flat as we possibly can. So when it's loaded, it's not just dropping off drastically from there. Uh, so that really, you have to design the motors very specifically for that use case. The control alg algorithms have to be done that way. Um, we're looking at uh, DC to DC inverters to keep the voltage pushed up high constantly. Um, high output from the battery pack for those things. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that, but it's designing for that case versus what the world does today, which is they design for the perfect world to get the highest number they possibly can from a... a boasting standpoint but it's really like a finite window mm. right that it operates like that and everything else is just sort of tapers off and tanks from there uh, yeah. another good example is uh hvac so let's account for six kilowatts of power draw to turn the ac on yeah yeah so i have a question with the uh range especially when carrying a loaded trailer would you I'd assume that the size of the trailer and how it looks would 
obviously impact the range. Like if it's boxy, it'll probably be very unaerodynamic. Would you consider creating your own types of trailers that would fit, I guess, a bet, or create a better uh, drag coefficient? Um, so that's definitely a sort of roadmap possibility for us as we look at even getting into bigger vehicles, um, box trucks and, and class eight vehicles and things like that. Uh, I'm a big RV guy. So uh, only because I live in Arizona now, if I was still in Michigan, I'd be a big boat guy again, but um, it's just, that's what you do out here. So is that a possibility? Um, maybe it's not a focus for the company right now. I think if we try to uh, if we try to, uh, I'll throw a little shade here. If we try to do motorsports and trucks and all this other stuff, we're probably going to fail. Um, so we really want to remain focused on where we're at today. But all of our, all of the math that we do to to make sure that we're confident in a lot of these numbers is assuming that it's like a big square box that we're pulling, right? It's like the almost the worst sort of case scenario in terms of a trailer that you're pulling, not one that's it's not an Airstream, you know, RV trailer, right? It's just a big square box that's behind you. And um, just, so it is independent rear steering. Um, so does that mean there's any potential for, I think, you know, we can have the tank turn and now GMC with the Hummer EV, they have the uh, crab walk, I believe it's called. So is there any mm -hmm. kind of something like that in the work for the XT or? Yeah, I mean, those are all really easy things to do, right? It's independent braking and motors in each wheel. So there's four motors, there's four brake systems. There's, um, and I mean that, there's four independent brake systems. Um, there's four, uh, right now it's it's uh, up front um, and in the rear uh, for the current generation development is uh, single systems, but actually the next generation that's coming is independent. So each okay. wheel can turn independent of the left or right one. And to do that with a long, long travel heavy duty suspension is completely unheard of with ground clearance and stuff that we're looking mm -hmm. at today. There's a number of companies that do that for high end sort of class four and five trucks, but they're, they're all low sitting box trucks for city driving. They're not necessarily something that can go on a dirt road or off road um, and have a lot of sort of travel and that suspension and a lot of get a lot of load bearing capability and things like that. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's going to be very cool because right now, something like a tank turn, uh, you could do it on pavement, but you have to break those tires loose. That's why it works on gravel or, or loose surfaces because it's easy to break those tires loose and then spin. Um, we're looking at, can we get enough turn for each one of those that we could actually pivot in place on pavement, which would be incredible. Um, it's possible today in some of these low speed shuttles, but again, they don't have a lot of travel. They've just got like a wheel that can spin 360 degrees. Um, so the future of that is that also when you think about that, um, some cool things, think about automated uh, alignment. Um, so think uh, never going to get your car aligned ever again because it's constantly aligning the front and rear tires uh, for performance reasons. Think of alignment dynamics changing when you're going around corners or when you're towing or all these different things eventually in the beginning it'll be very standard but eventually as we continue to improve the algorithms and the software and maybe even some of the hardware is think about all of the crazy dynamic things that can happen when you're towing or or um you know backing things up or trailers or you're overloaded or what have you um, we can build in some really cool, not just uh, features, but safety um, mechanisms in there. Definitely, yeah. No, it sounds uh, really promising, all right? And um, like, like, do you guys have any like rough kind of date for hopeful production of the XT? Like as in like, I don't know, Q4 2022 or Q2? Yeah, so I think if you're, if you're looking for XT deliverables, you should be looking in 2022 because our we've also got a, a massive reservation backlog. Um, okay. I think we're a, a bit above 33,000 reservations today uh, oh, wow, for the yeah. XT. Um, the XP platform and the battery technology, we're definitely looking to get to market this year. Uh, I'd love to get the XT to market by the end of the year, but that's all funding and team growth dependent and whether or not we make progress. I think if we push into 2022, it's not horrible. 
yes, there are other trucks coming to market this year, but mm. this is a there's lots of opportunity out there. So I'm not worried about Atlas being first to market. I'm more worried about Atlas being right. So um, the first product that we get out there, it has to be good and it has to be really good. It can't be a leap backwards. It has to be that leap forward. Uh, but we don't want to take 10 years to do that too, right? There is a, that concept of being too late. Um, so if you're looking for an XT pickup truck though, you might want to think 2022 or 2023, given the backlog that we have. Um, it really depends on how fast we can scale though uh, and how fast we can get something to market. Now we are looking at getting a prototype built um, and showed off and driving around and stuff for everyone to see uh, in the beginning, the beginning part of this year for the XT production mm -hmm. end and then into 2022. Uh, and then, of course, platform. The reason why we're able to do that short timeline is because everything's built into the platform. So the platform is really targeted for this year, and then it's just putting a top hat on it. Yeah, cool. yeah I'm going to be interested in, like, not not now, of course, but in the future. Like, yeah. you talk about the proprietary battery technology, the platform. Would you ever be interested if someone um, to license the, uh, your proprietary battery technology or something like that? Yep. In fact, we have a couple of conversations going right now for uh, the battery technology and uh, delivering that into very specific uh, equipment and vehicle applications. And then uh, we have a couple of conversations going on now where, uh, oops, excuse me. I want to sneeze. I swear to God, I do. It just doesn't want to come. Um, where uh, the v the sorry the platform itself as well as some of the underlying technology will go into some niche uh, or niche vehicle applications, um, and those are long conversations, right? There's a lot of sort of due diligence. There's a lot of requirements evaluation that's going on right now. In fact, we just got a set of requirements uh, last week um, to start digging into some of that stuff. So uh, we've got a lot of those things that are happening Q1, Q2 this coming year. Um, where you're going to see Atlas delivering by the end of 2021 um, the underlying sort of platform technology into these different vehicle segments that are largely untapped. So we cool. like to focus on the unsexy markets because there's bigger market opportunities there. It allows us to scale um, and it's typically widely ignored. Yeah, I know definitely. I think it was quite a smart move going into the, like with a strong emphasis on the commercial segment um, right yeah no um I, I also must say actually i like the way you guys do the kind of like weekly roundup on your instagram like you show like progress and stuff i think that looks good to see as well um, yeah it's i think that's what's missing in the world right is there's a lot of companies do a lot of marketing and if you really pay attention to the marketing you tell it's like sort of set up it's mm -hmm. staged right and it's sort of like designed to build hype Atlas is very real. Like here we are, this is what we're doing. This is where we're at today. This is what's happening. Um, there's no, like, there's no sort of smoke and mirrors there. There's, yeah, we want to build up hype and we'll start doing more of those sort of fun, exciting things as we get, uh, as we sort of progress through 2021. Um, but it's going to be a little more raw. I think, think more YouTube channel than um, sort of uh, Super Bowl car commercial. Cause I think, while those things are fun, they're sort of a one and done. Uh, we really want to like share this progress and this sort of epic journey that we're on as we continue to go for the next several years. Mm -hmm. I feel like you, uh, I can't say the company because I want to be nice, but it's almost like you uh, described another company out there producing electric yeah. cars. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. We, we won't several, use our name. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so I, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I think, I mean, building hype is important, right? And building excitement is important. You have to sell the dream. You have to sell, you know, what the vision, right? And what you're doing. I think what makes Atlas different is that we're selling the dream and the vision and we're talking about it, but we're also showing you like every ugly little step that you take to get there. Um, which I, when we look back on 2020, 2019, 2021, we're going to look back on it and say, oh my God, Right. Like, like we, we did that. We went through that. That's how that's what things look like back then. It's so easy now. Um, or maybe it won't be. I don't know. But it'll be a it'll be a great uh, a great way to sort of look back and see where we came from and where we're going. 
Yeah, I think that transparency there is also a very big selling point to many people, knowing what their deposit went down on or what they're looking for in the future. I think I think right. it's a good thing. Yeah, we're very honest. So we we show you where your dollars are being spent. Um, and I mean, with it comes the good and the bad, right? The good is we're transparent. You can never say Atlas didn't tell you something because here it is. Um, with the bad always comes, most people see things once all of that work is done, right? It's sort of like poof and it's there and they forget that all of this sort of ugliness happened before that, that sort of shiny object was shown off. So uh, I think one of our concluding questions, because we usually try to keep up each episode around an hour. Uh, do you have any uh, talks about Atlas coming to uh, entering the stock exchange, becoming public? Yeah, so um, like I said in the very beginning is that uh, we can't announce anything or, or really say much outside of that we are in these discussions today um, and we're looking at sort of what the market is doing and what's out there and what some of that opportunity looks like. And if we find something that is appealing to us, then we'll, we'll discuss more of that. We're also very skeptical of it um, because there's been a lot of hype around it and we wanna make sure that Atlas is in the right position to do that. Um, but it's definitely, if you look at it, it's a great opportunity to raise the kind of capital that we need um, in a very relatively short amount of time. Uh, what I think sets Atlas apart from all of the others that have sort of gone through this process is how transparent we are. Um, you, we are not going to go into something like this it, without people actually knowing anything about us. Um, you'll be able to watch those YouTube videos, those weekly updates. You'll be able to see the technology in action. You'll be able to see everything that we're doing, our business model, our plans, everything is out there and it's in the open. So there, there really is no secret there. Um, and I think that's what's going to set us apart from the rest that are out there. But uh, we're definitely looking at those opportunities uh, just because of what they represent. But no decisions or anything have been made. Okay. And yeah, thanks very much, Mark, for coming on. Of course, we really appreciate it. Like, of course, you know, very busy man. <laughs> so um, yeah, I know I wish you all the best and it's been great talking. Yeah, yeah thanks thank for you. having me, guys. It's always fun. <laughs>